Thank you all for being here tonight. I want to get right into the lesson. Thank Praise and Worship for turning it over to Praise and Worship team. Uh, we are continuing on in our series and tonight from Hebrews 6. And we have been going through the foundational principles of scripture, uh, foundational things we should understand. And no, and verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of. Let's not have to go back over this again. Repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrines of baptism, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Those are the six. We've done repentance from dead works, faith toward God, doctrines of baptism. Tonight we're on number four, the laying on of hands. Um, and I believe the will of the Lord is for us to go back to the days where we used to lay hands on people. And we're going to start that on tonight. Amen. Um, we, I mean, we lay hands on sick people. But I think some, there's some demons we need to cast out of some of these other people up in here. <laughs> um, and again, I think I mentioned before the progression of how these foundational things are laid out is significant. It talks about repentance from dead works. It's a lifestyle. Faith toward God. It's a lifestyle. Baptism. Again, these are all lifestyle things that we should be... Uh, have as a part of our lives. I don't know if I mentioned when we talked about baptisms, I looked at the five different types of baptisms, and then we looked at this term of being filled with the Spirit, and it doesn't mean that it happens one time in your life. It's an ongoing thing that you should uh, find yourself before the fountain of God and ask God to fill you up with His power and presence on a regular. It's what we need. Amen. We need that power and presence of God flowing over us on a regular. It's got to be a lifestyle. And then there's this laying on of hands, and that's what we want to talk about beginning tonight, laying on of hands. Okay. Um, let's talk about what it means. It is the laying on of hands is a channel of divine impartation. It is a channel of divine impartation. It is God depositing supernaturally and spiritually in you his anointing, his power, his gifting. It is an impartation. Now, let me, I need to say this right at the outset at the beginning of this because uh, some people think it's, it's magic. They treat the laying on of hands like it's abracadabra. Uh, it's not that. It's, it's, it's more than just a concept or a mentality of, of just being touched. It's, it's much bigger than that. It is uh, you know, laying your hands on some, well, we're going to talk about this, but it is embracing and understanding and believing. It's not, you know, I want to shun us away from thinking that it is just something, super, something mysterious, some... Uh, It's you know, a word I'm looking for, but, you know, when you get old, you can't remember the words you, you want to draw. <laughs> Spooky. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not, um, yeah, it's not, I, I don't know the word. It'll probably come to me when, when I, on my way home tonight, it'll probably come to me. Uh, it's you exposing yourself and being submitted to. See, you, you want somebody to lay their hands on you, but you don't want to get underneath their authority. That means something right there. Yeah, if you, if you don't, if you, you know, getting hands laid and having a divine impartation is more than just being touched. It is, it is being open to and receiving and embracing and believing and following and applying to your life what it is you've been taught. 
That's what it means. So it's not just, you know, if I thought that all I had to do was lay hands on people and they would have what God gave me, Lord, I'd be smacking y'all upside y'all head. Pow! If I thought that that's all it took, it's bigger than that. You understand what I'm saying? We have people who come to this church, but they're not, they can't get the impartation because they haven't embraced. They don't follow. They don't believe. So I don't, I don't want you all to think that it's just about being touched because it's greater than that. Uh, when the people uh, came and we're going to see some scriptures here in a few moments. When the, and here's what I want you to keep in mind. When Jesus laid his hands on people and they got healed, it wasn't just Jesus touching them. It was them extending their faith in him to believe that he could do it. Uh, one guy came to Jesus and said, you know, I have a sick child. And I believe if you just come and lay your hands, it wasn't just the physical touch. It is the belief to the core that he had the power to do bring healing into his child's life. Yeah. Thank all five of y'all very much. I appreciate that. So these scriptures, let's look at these scriptures. Let's go to uh, Romans 1, 11. Again, the apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says in verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established. There's an impartation. This is, this is the piece I want you to see here is that it is in fact an impartation. It does have meaning and significance and that it is a part of it is a divine impartation. First Timothy uh, chapter 4 verse 15, 14. Let's look at First Timothy 4 14. I hope I'm not going too fast for y'all when I do this. Do not, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. So um, don't, don't let that gift in you be neglected, that scripture says. And you got that gift by an impartation that was deposited in you by the laying on of hands. Again, therefore, first, 2 Timothy 1, 6, 2 Timothy 1, 6 says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Uh, again, an impartation that Paul deposited upon and in the people of God. Uh, this is what we are believing and embracing. In the Old Testament, let's look at the background of where this whole thing got started and, and how God get, gives us... Um, a symbol of it in the old, it began in the Old Testament in where the Old Testament priests laid their hands on the sin offering to consecrate it to God. Uh, Leviticus chapter 16 verse 21. And, and here's, here's, here's what happens back in that day. And matter of fact, this is repeated multiple times. In, um, in the book of Leviticus, all through Leviticus. I gave you one verse, but there's a ton of verses that conveys this. So when it came time for the people to have their sins forgiven, they would take the offering, the, the sacrifice, the animal that was going to be sacrificed, and um, the priest would come and, and take the gift, take the sacrifice, and lay his hands upon that sacrifice. And it was a... Uh, it represented and it transferred the sins of the people onto the sacrifice. The hands was laid on the sacrifice and there was a transference of the sins of the people onto the, to the sacrifice. And sometimes the sacrifice was killed. And sometimes throughout the scripture, the sacrifice was sent into the woods, into the wilderness, never to be found again. Isn't that great right there? The symbolism of that, that God... Uh, puts the sins on the, the sacrifice of the animal and it goes into the woods never to be found again. Somebody ought to give God a praise on that point right there. Leviticus 16, 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. It would take the sin away. It was a transference. 
that went away. Praise him. Jot all these verses down. Just write. Just, just don't. We're not going to turn there, but just jot them down because I know y'all go home and read all these verses that I give y'all every time. Chapter 1, verse 4. All of these are in Leviticus. All these verses I'm going to give you in, in Leviticus is in, is in the book I just finished reading to you. 1, 4. 3, 2. 3, verse 8. 3, verse 13. 4, verse 4. 4 and 4. 4 and 15. 4 and 24. 4 and 29. 4 and 33. And so, uh, it, there was a transference. Now let's look at some fresh purposes of this thing for us today. Number one is healing. Multiple places in scripture where people were sick and hands were laid upon them and they were healed. Secondly, there's a deposit of a blessing. The transmission of spiritual blessings. You can write that down. It's not on this, the... Uh, the slide, but that's what it means, a transmission of spiritual blessing. And thirdly, there's an ordination. It means you're, getting, you're being separated for a specific work. In the New Testament and in the early church, when somebody wanted to be filled with the presence of God or have the presence of God to receive the Holy Spirit in the early church, they had hands laid on them. And that was in the early church. But we know now through the teaching of the word that the moment we accept Jesus, we receive the Spirit of God living inside of us. Amen. Y'all got that? Let's look at some healings. The Bible's got a multiplicity of healings. I'm just going to read a couple of these. I'm not going to read all of them, but I just want you to see again that one of the things that we do still in our church that we've always done is when somebody is sick, we um, invite them up and we lay hands on them. And we're gonna, I just want to show you several verses here today where people are healed when uh, Jesus laid there his hands on them and they got healed. Mark chapter 5, verse 23. One of the rulers of the synagogue named Jairus uh, came to Jesus and fell at his feet. And verse 23 says, And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. And in fact... Jesus went and a great multitude followed him and he laid his hands on her and she was healed. Um, Mark 8.23 He took a blind man by the hand and laid him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up, verse 24, and said, I see men like trees walking. The blind man was brought to Jesus, and they begged him. I'm going to read verse 22. Let me read verse 22. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him. And here's what they said. They begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him and asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. I love that story. Because it's okay for us to go back to, for him to touch us again. Yeah. Amen. The man got healed. And even though he received his sight, his, his sight wasn't totally clear, but he came back. And sometimes we have to 
keep ourselves before the hand of God and the touch of God and the power of God and the presence of God. Don't think that you've arrived just because you got touched one time. Uh, Luke 440. Luke 440 says, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. Speaking of Jesus. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. There was a divine impartation made by Jesus laying hands on them. And then finally, I'm just going to give you 13, 13. And y'all got all the other verses. I'm not going to read all of them. They all say basically the same thing. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. This is, uh, again, the whole point here is there's a divine impartation. The laying on of hands uh, is a divine impartation of healing. Now, in Acts chapter 28 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul, Acts 28, 8, we have an example of this with the Apostle Paul. Uh, it happened that the father of Poop, this person lay sick of a fever and dysentery. That's diarrhea, by the way. Men, Paul went in to him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. So the Apostle Paul, uh, that gift flowed that anointing flowed through him, a divine impartation. And y'all got that? Can I go to the next slide? Okay, I know I'm going kind of fast. Finally, we are called to lay hands on people who are sick. God wants you and I to live our lives so that we can be instruments and channels of God's divine impartation to flow through us. And that's uh, the scripture Mark chapter 16, verse 17 says, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And that's what we do. That's what we believe. That's our process. We lay hands on people and believe God to heal them. Um, look at James chapter 5 verse 17 is anyone among you sick let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This is a profound passage. This is what we're supposed to do. Amen. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. And we're going to anoint them with oil. We're going to lay our hands on them. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord, we will believe, will raise them up. Amen. So one component of laying on of hands is healing. Secondly, there's a blessing. I want to talk about a blessing. In the Old Testament is a model of this. is The fathers laid their hands on their children to bestow a blessing upon them and a blessing over them. Uh, Genesis chapter 48 talks about this blessing. Uh, Israel blessed his sons. Chapter 48 verses 14 through 20, how he called them to himself in the latter days of his life and laid his hands upon them and imparted a blessing upon them. And in Mark chapter 10, Jesus blessed the children, laid his hands on the children and blessed them. There is a blessing. And 
we're going to believe God for the blessings for people and healing for people today. I've told the story of, uh, many, many times um, when I was preaching one time in Baltimore when I was a kid and I went to this church one Thanksgiving and I was pastor asked me to come down and pray for the people and I'm at the altar praying that people just a church had an altar where people came up and kneeled down and I was praying and I was just like just and I got carried away and I hit this lady side the head and her her hat her hat fell off and I think something went with the hat when it fell off <laughs> then I went back to that church a year later and the lady came up to me and said, you know who I am? I said, no. She said, I'm the lady you hit in the head last year when you was at the altar. I said, oh yeah, I do remember you. She said, I was having migraine headaches. And ever since you hit me in the head, my, head, my migraines have gone away. Now, if I thought that I could heal her of her migraines, I would have went over to her and says, I would have laid, it would have been a production. <laughs> you know, I would have went through the whole shebang. If I thought that laying hands on Daryl would deliver him from that Dallas Cowboy demon, <laughs> both hands would go on him. That foul spirit come out. <laughs> if I thought. So there's a blessing associated with it. I don't know how I got carried away on that, but here's number three. His letter C is ordination. It is a setting apart. It is the process of acknowledging a person has done due diligence to prepare themselves for ministry and lay hands on them, to set them apart and ordain them for the work that God has called them to do. Now, one of the things that we're trying to move toward in our church, and, you know, it takes us a while to get there, but, you know, we ordain people in the pastoral calling and in teacher calling, but I want us to move toward even the other three gifts that are mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4 and pray to God that we would acknowledge people who have a prophetic gift on their life and an evangelism gift on their life. We want to be able to empower people to function in the gifting that God has called them to do. Once they've studied and shown themselves faithful and dedicated and trustworthy and having learned the information and practiced the gift in an appropriate way, then it is my hope and prayer that we'll be able to uh, lay hands on people uh, uh, beyond just the pastoral gifting because that's kind of where we are right now with pastors and teachers but it is my prayer and hope that we will set people aside uh, beyond just the ones that we've done in the past Amen um, And all these verses again show where people are set aside um, for an assignment and for a specific work and are anointed to do that and have hands laid on them at the conclusion of that process. Now we do that here. We do lay our hands and we do set people aside uh, presently for uh, certain callings and giftings. We do um, that for uh, pastors and teachers and I'm hoping to do it even beyond that. Now, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 because this, one, this verse tells us something very important. Um, and let me spend a few moments talking about this because it says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Don't be too quick with it. And that's 1 Timothy 5.22. Uh, we're not, I'm not quick to lay, to ordain people. And I'm not quick to endorse people. Uh, I was talking to somebody 
who's a minister at another church and they're interested in coming to First Baptist, I tell them, let me tell you right off the bat, the process at our church is we have to observe you for a year. See how you get along with people. See how you function. Are you loyal? Are you faithful? Are you dedicated? So we, we check you out. Do you, are you in class? Do you take lessons? Do you come to prayer service? Are you involved in the ministry? Do you pay tithes and offerings? Y'all missed that part. I said tithes and offerings. Yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't rush into this. We don't quickly do this. Um, when I first came to the church, you could be a minister from another church and come to First Baptist Church and join, and you'd be a minister the next Sunday. We don't do that here. Them days is over. Tell your neighbor, them days is over. We want to get to know who you is. We want to know your character. Yeah. We want to know, you know, we don't, we don't do it hastily. And we... And, and, and this is important, too. Uh, um, we don't ordain even the people who've been here for long. I, I know I had a contentious with a person some years ago at this church uh, who wanted to be ordained, and they wanted to be ordained just because they had been here for such a long time. And I gave the person a, an assignment. I said, here's what you got to do. It was simple stuff. And thank God I put it in writing. I praise the Lord I put it in writing because he didn't do not, none of the things I said do. And it was simple things. They weren't hard. And he didn't do them. And when I didn't ordain him, he got upset and went and got ordained someplace else. Fine with me. I ain't missed him. Look at your neighbor and say, we ain't missed him. So uh, I think um, when we ordain people, um, I have some requirements for them. First of all, you have to lead a ministry. You have to show me that you have the capacity to lead a ministry, lead people. You know how to get along with people, work with people, care for people. I want to see that you have that as a part of your makeup and your character. I'm not just going to lay my hands on you. And you, it has not been demonstrated that you can provide leadership. You've got, you got to show that you, you can do that. Um, and I only, I think I ordain about once every 20 years. <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but ain't far from it. Uh, and so what that means is you have to, you know, for those ministers who are looking to be ordained, I'm just talking about this to the ministers for a moment, just for a minute while we're here. Um, when that season comes, you have to be ready. And, and that's just the truth of life. Uh, you can't keep procrastinating and putting stuff off. You, you have to, when, 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 when the water gets troubled, you need to be ready to roll over into the water. That, that, that paralyzed man was by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. And it seemed to me that if I've been there for 38 years and once a year, every, every year for 38 years, the water gets troubled and somebody touches the water and get healed, look like to me, I'd be laid right by, I'd be right by, I'd be right by. Amen. I wouldn't be on the other side of the pool shooting a breeze with somebody. I'd be right there so that the moment I thought it was troubled, I'd just roll on over in there. And some of you, you know, God's calling you to do some stuff, but you, you keep pushing it off. You, y'all, you can't keep pushing it off. Y'all don't know when Jesus is coming back. You don't know when the opportunity is going to come for you to be ready and right. It's best to be ready. Look at your neighbor and say, it's best to be ready. Look, to, turn on the other side. Tell the person on the other side, it's best to be ready. Tell them. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14 bears out, follows up with what I'm saying to you today. It says, do not neglect the, the, the do not, <laughs> do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Don't neglect it. Don't sit on it. 
Don't waste it. Some of you got callings on your life and you haven't cultivated it. You haven't utilized it. There's been a deposit made in you and you ain't done nothing with it. You sitting back because you are preoccupied with all other stuff and you're missing out on what God has for you. Don't neglect the gift of God that God has put in you. Second Timothy chapter one, verse six says this. 2 Timothy 1, 6. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Uh, that's written. Don't, again, all of these says, stir it up, don't neglect it, keep it active, keep it alive, keep it fresh, keep it rolling, keep it rolling, keep it rolling. Don't sit on it, don't waste it. It's the call of God upon all of our lives. We have to be active and and, and functioning and flowing in the gifts that God has put in us. Can I get an amen right there from anybody? Finally, in the early church, we see where they received the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. And those, you can write those verses down. I'm not going to read it, but you can jot it down for your study. Uh, Acts 8, 17, 9, 17, and 9, 6. Okay, y'all got that? All right. I'm going to leave that up for a few more minutes. I'm going to take any questions that y'all have, then we're going to pray for people tonight. Amen. I'm going to call people up in sections. I'm going to first start off with people who, want, who, who are praying for healing. And we're going to pray for you. Lay hands on you. Now, anybody got any questions, come to the mic. I have a couple of internet questions. Um, why is it that some people never get completely healed from a disease or a medical condition even after they've prayed, fasted, and believed God for it? It's a great question. So one of the things that uh, we have to um, discern is what's the purpose and the reason why God permitted the sickness in the first place. Um, some, you know, God, there's, there's several reasons why a sickness might be there. It might be uh, a, a sickness. Most of our sicknesses comes from disobedience. You keep on eating wrong, you're going to get a disease. So some sickness is from disobedience. And, and laying, hands, laying hands on you and you keep on eating the chitlins is not going to make you live. It's not. I love chitlins, but I had to let them go. I had to let them go because I want to live. I want to live. I haven't had, I had, had chitlins all day today. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. I, 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 I moved away. I had to, I, I want to live. I had to stop. And it's tough because we live in a cu culture where the food is not the best that we eat. A lot of our diseases is from how we eat and our failure to exercise. We can lay hands on you, spit on you, pour oil on you. It ain't going to change. If you keep not eating right. So that's one reason for sickness. Another one, sickness is it's time for you to go. Sickness is time. It's your time, your season. You finish your assignment. You finish your, the purpose God created you, and it's time for you to go. Some sickness is because of the glory of God. Somehow through it, God's going to get the glory. When I think about this woman, Bunny Wilson, I don't know if y'all know who Bunny Wilson is. Bunny Wilson was an incredible, is an incredible writer, author, um, speaker, communicator, spoke for us at our church many, many times. And she came down with a condition that they still don't know what condition is. She's been sick for about 20 years. And, uh, but she outlived her husband. Her husband died. She's still fighting that condition and, you know, and, and all, but um, the way she loves God, 
And the way she loves people through her condition is amazing. And uh, she, I wish, you know, if she was here today, she would just give you a testimony of, of how even her condition, as horrible as it is, how so many people have been impacted and touched by her life being that way. So I don't have all the answers for why God doesn't heal people all the time. I don't know. I'm just giving you those are the three things I know why God permits it condition and, and sometimes God heals people sometimes he doesn't and that's his choice and call yes ma'am um in my life group meeting we had a discussion on your message concerning resurrection of the dead uh, we discussed the scripture that you gave us in Hebrews 9 27 it is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment some in the group believes that this means that no one can be raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit because you only get to die once. Others in the group believe that this is not what that scripture means and that Jesus raised the dead and blessed the disciples and commanded them to heal the sick and raise the dead in Matthews 10, 1, 7 through 8. And Jesus said in John 14, 12 to 14, that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these will he do. What say you? <laughs> <laughs> I say that we ain't talking about that tonight. That's not the topic tonight. But because you're in our life group, and I'm so mm -hmm. proud of you, and y'all are discussing the message, I'm going to answer your question. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. The verse is dealing with some beliefs that uh, trying to help us understand that you don't, you don't die and come back as a dog. Or you don't come back has a general in the army. Reincarnation, okay. You don't get a second opportunity to, to be anything again. Mm -hmm. But God has the right and the power to supersede any laws of nature that he created. And that's what a miracle is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And God mm -hmm. can do a miracle anytime he wants to and has done it. Yes. Lazarus died and was in the grave four days and he called him up out of the grave to defy nature. So yeah, God, God can do that. The verse is not trying to say God can't bring somebody from the dead. That verse is trying to tell us once you die, the next step on the agenda is for you to um, uh, stand before the judgment seat of God. Is the now, next step, but you, but you, but God can raise you back to, to okay. To life. Now, what what they were saying in that group also is that that was only because Jesus did that, and it was only because of the beginning of the church that there were signs and wonders, and we don't need them kind of signs and wonders no more. And I'm telling you, this was going on in the group. <laughs> well, I, well, listen, I'm, first of all, I'm glad y'all talking about it. Yeah, yeah. It's okay to talk about it. Yeah, and, okay. And, you know, um, I believe, I believe uh, God has the right that if he feels he wants to bring somebody back to life, he can. Amen. And that we as believers can have that authority and power. If we operate in it? We, not, not us. God, we, we can't yeah. heal nobody. No, right. That, but, we but, can that, but you speak. raise an interesting I point. I said we as believers can have we, that we, authority. We have the faith. We uh -huh. can have the faith to pray and ask God. Right. But we don't have the power to do that. Right. We, don't, we can't Absolutely. heal people. We don't, we don't, uh, okay. we, any, any supernatural power. We're not God. We're not God. We mm -hmm. are channels of God's power. We are Amen. instruments of God's power. Yeah, that's so understood. we ask God. God may choose to, God may choose not to. So yes, I've faced, okay. um, I, let me just tell you this for a moment. So, um, you know, I, through my years in church, I've been in church since I was a little kid, and I've seen everything. I've seen all kinds of stuff in church. I saw, I, I was here when, at First Baptist, when the five blind boys from Mississippi or Alabama or someplace, they came. Mm -hmm. And they were singing, uh, on a Sunday, down, 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 on a Sunday, I got rid of my down, down, heavy load, down, down. They were singing, and one of the blind men stopped walking like he was going to leave, and they had to go and get him and stop him and bring him back because he was blind. Mm -hmm. But when church was over, that blind man went and got in the car and drove <laughs>
couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Now, do you believe he was really blind? No, he wasn't blind. He got in the car. No, he wasn't blind. <laughs> you know what? Now, that's funny you should bring that up. Oh, that's, baby, that's he was, part, he's not blind. Yeah, he wasn't blind. Because that's, that's really some of what they was bringing up in the group, too, that when the stories of people today that yeah. have been raised from the dead wasn't really dead. Yeah, well. <laughs> that's what they're saying. I believe, I do believe God can... And I've known stories of God raising people from the yes. dead. He raises so us up from the dead every day. All right. Amen. Amen. He, he does it. Right. So anyway, I, I didn't mm -hmm. tell that story about the blind man. I, that's just a joke that came to my mm -hmm. mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a true story. But I, but I started to tell you about, I, I, through the course of my life in the Christian walk, I had times I was so gung-ho on faith and believing God for miracles, for everything. We had faith healers come to our church. And we had them lay hands and pray for people, and some people got healed. Amen. And there were some people we had in our church that we believed God was going to heal them, and they died after the faith healers yeah. touched them and healed them, and they died. Yeah. So it has, what it brought to me is a level of balance to what we should believe. I didn't lose my faith in God because those people died. I just, I learned, you know, that um, it's up to God to determine who lives and who dies. It's, it's not our choice. Right. We, don't, we don't make the determination. We don't decide. Amen. It's not the power in us to do it. So, I mean, but the bottom line, if people don't have that kind of faith, it's okay. If they don't believe God can raise people from the dead, that's fine. They don't, they don't have to. We ain't gonna, we're not going to stop speaking to each other because of that. I believe God can do whatever God wants to do. Amen. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Pastor Jenkins. Hey. So, I have a question. Okay, so um, in February, on the 10th, you were talking about baptisms. And so, I'm coming up on July on, like, my 10-year anniversary since my baptism. And I was thinking since that service, like, how do you know if you should be um, re-baptized? Like, if you, you know, it's like a little stale. You're a little disobedient. <laughs> you know? No. So, the purpose of baptism is a public confession of your faith in Jesus. If you get saved and you accept Jesus, your first act of obedience is to get baptized. That's what every believer should do. Now, if you got baptized and you weren't saved, that's a dead work. You need to get baptized again. But if you were saved when you got, you got saved, then you got baptized, you don't need to do that one time in your life. You don't need to do it again, right? Because the baptism is just a public confession, and it's an act of obedience, right? So it, you don't, it's not something wearing off. It's just, it's like sometimes you hear people, like I know people would be like, I've been baptized like two, three, four times, and it's like, huh? Well, if they, weren't, if they were not saved when they got no. baptized the first time, or the second time, or the third time, or the fourth time, <laughs> they, <laughs> they need to get saved first. Now, some churches baptize every year. You know, they, you know, some churches you go and get baptized every year. That's not what we believe. We believe it's a one-time thing. Once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, put your believing you get saved, then once you do it, it's a that's a one time thing. It, it doesn't. There's no power in the baptism. It's not like there's, you know, some anointing upon you. You're just obeying God. The greater thing for us to do every day of our lives is to obey God. All right, let's do this. We're going to take up the offering first. Come on. Let me lay, let's lay some hands on the altars, on the offering plate. Anybody want to get saved tonight? Anybody want to join our church? Anybody want to rededicate themselves? If that's you, get on up and come down here real quick while we prepare to take this offering. Anybody want to get saved, accept Jesus, rededicate themselves, or you're already saved, you want to join the church. Right now, right this moment would be the time to come. Come right now while the blood is running warm in your veins and you have the activities of your limbs. Right now is the time. <laughs>